Vibha Chahan and welcome to Jai Hind Classes Funda Clear. In this video, I'll explain the chapter 5 of class 11th Political Science. The chapter that we have got for this video is Legislature. So Legislature, now we have already completed the chapter 4th which was about Executive, the first organ of the government. Next we have another organ of the government which is the Legislature. We all know that Legislature is the chief law making body of a country but in this chapter we will look at it in a broad manner. We will see that how the Parliament or the Legislature controls itself, controls the Executive, the position, powers, functions of the parliament and completely an overall perspective over the parliament or the legislature we do know the importance of elections and that's why we see that this chapter becomes important because legislature is a body of representatives which have come in power by the election as we have already seen the importance of election we can say that how important the legislature is so without any further ado let's get started with the first topic that is why do we need a parliament? So why do we need a parliament? First of all, what is the basic need for parliament? Parliament is all you know that it is the national legislature of a country. In every country there is a parliament which is a national legislature if there is any. Now what happens that there is a very common question, the need for parliament, what it is. We do know that in a democracy, people are the final authority and they can't make laws for themselves because there are so many they lack in skills. That is why they choose their representatives by election and those representatives are in parliament. So parliament becomes very important for a country because it is the chief lawmaking body of a country and above that it is the body of representatives of the people. However, it is not restricted to that point. Making uh, laws for country is but one of the functions of the parliament. There are many other functions of the parliament such as walkouts, anonymity, legislations, control over executive, financial control. There are so many other functions of parliament as well. In recent years, we have seen that the cabinet has taken more power, is now initiating policies, bills in the parliament. However, the cabinet has to retain majority in the parliament as to get approval for the policies or bill to be passed. So we can see that even if the cabinet has taken more power in the parliament, still the representatives of the people are in power. Government can't surpass the parliament. However, the parliament is the one who is controlling at hand. So we can say that there is definitely clearly a need for parliament in a country as to run the country in a more administrative way in a more efficient way and in a more effective way for the country. So if there is a parliament in the country, it will be in the benefit for the country. Secondly, the question is that why do we need two houses of a parliament? We can see that in India we have two houses of parliament which is Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha. Lok Sabha is the house of people and Rajya Sabha is the council of states. What is the need for these two? Well, when in the parliament there are two houses, it is known as bicameral legislature. In India, we have the central uh, legislation body that is the parliament. We have the parliament as a bicameral legislature. However, the states of India have been given an option whether to be unicameral or bicameral. Some of the uh, bicameral states in our country are Uttar Pradesh, Telangana, Bihar and these are some of the bicameral legislatures in our country. We have seen that most uh, of the big countries even in geographical point of view or in population point of view, they are opting for this bicameral legislature because bicameral legislature gives every person, every uh, kind of equal representation to all the parts of the country in terms of geographical point of view as well as in terms of population like different from different cultures, religions and different communities of a country. So we can say that this bicameral legislature is um, accommodating the diversity and unity of a country. We can see that for a large country and such a diverse country as of India, we definitely need a bicameral legislature. 
we can also see other examples of bicameral legislature such as Germany where there is Buddha Stag and Buddha Stress which is the Federal Council and Federal Assembly so we can see that there are bicameral legislatures all over the world and they are important because they are not just for like a representation to everybody they can give representation because we have two uh, houses in our parliament one of which is council of states barely giving the representation to the states second one is for the people house of the people as the name suggests it is for the representation of the people so the two houses of the parliament represent all sections of the society from the geographical point of view and from the community or society point of view that's why bicameral legislature becomes important in a country the third topic in this chapter is Rajya Sabha. Now one of the houses of the parliament is the Rajya Sabha or the Council of States. As we have seen, the uh, we have already seen the election manner of Rajya Sabha which is a kind of proportional vote with a single transferable vote. We have already seen that for Rajya Sabha, members are not elected directly by the people and they are indirectly elected by the people. People in a state legislative assembly elect their uh, uh, representatives and those state legislative assembly members elect these Rajya Sabha members. So Rajya Sabha members are kind of indirectly elected by the people. Rajya Sabha is also known as a council of states. So each of the states has equal representation in our country in the Rajya Sabha. Now what happens that even the representation of Rajya Sabha can be of two types symmetrical and asymmetrical. Symmetrical is the one where every uh, state uh, irrespective of their population or area have been given equal seats. For example let us take the example of the US. In the US, you have the Senate instead of Rajya Sabha. In the Senate, there are suppose 100 seats and there are 50 states in America. So uh, irrespective of their size, they all have been given two seats in the Senate. So as it would be counted to 100 and they would be equally divided among all the states of the US. However, in India, we have chosen a complete different system. There is another way of representation in Rajya Sabha, which is asymmetrical representation. Presentation. Now, in this one, what happens that the, uh, uh, the states are not given seats on the basis uh, on the basis of equality, but they are given on the basis of their population. Because if we choose symmetrical representation in country, what would happen? A large state such as the Uttar Pradesh, we would see that whose population is more than twenty million, and a small state like Sikkim, which has a population even less than a million, would have the same seats in the Rajya Sabha. It is completely unfair because we. We can see that there is a lot of inequality. They should be given representation in the Rajya Sabha according to their proportion in the country. That's why Uttar Pradesh has 31 seats and Sikkim has one seat in the Rajya Sabha. So we can say that there are two types of representation in Rajya Sabha. First is symmetrical representation which has been adopted in the US and second is asymmetrical representation which has been adopted in our country we can clearly see that the first one that is a symmetrical one would not work in our country because we have a lot of diversity unequal distribution of population in the country unequal distribution of land in our country and that's why we can't choose a symmetrical one in our country so that's how the Rajya Sabha works we have seen that council of states is kind of the state have been given representation and that's why they have been given some special powers as well so that the states would have more representation what happens that these states have been given representation in the Rajya Sabha to um, bring up their regional problems such as the state matters of each and every state but what we are seeing right now is that these members of Rajya Sabha are more keenly to uh, uh, bring the matters of the political parties than their states and the members of Rajya Sabha are elected for six years. However, they are never completely dissolved. Every 
two years, one third of the members are dissolved or have to be re-elected. So they have a term of six years and every two years, one third of the members of Rajya Sabha will be re-elected. Now, the benefit of this kind of arrangement is that when um, the Lok Sabha is completely dissolved and the elections are yet to be uh, held, what would happen if there are urgent matters to be discussed? That would take place in Rajya Sabha. So that's why this arrangement has been been um, adopted by our country. Rajya Sabha as we see is also called the second chamber of our country where there are 245 members. Now out of these 233 are directly elected by the state legislative assembly members and other 11 are appointed by the president of India. So we can say that 11 are nominated and 233 are elected indirectly elected by the people or directly elected by the state legislative assembly members. Now the next house of the parliament comes here that is the Lok Sabha. Lok Sabha or the House of the People. Now this is directly elected by the people. People choose their representatives as members of the Lok Sabha, not the Rajya Sabha. For the elections of Lok Sabha, our country is divided into 543 constituencies on a basis of roughly equal population. And since 1971 census, they have remained the same. That is 543 constituencies, no more or less. Other than that, we have two seats nominated and appointed by the president they are. So we can say that two are nominated and the other 543 are elected directly by the people. The member of Lok Sabha has a term of five years and after five years, if there is no concept such as one third dissolve, uh, dis dissolution or some, something like that, it will be complete after five years and after five years, the whole Lok Sabha will be dissolved. However, even before dissolution, the Lok Sabha can, dis can be dissolved by the advice of Prime Minister to the President, as we've already seen. So if the Prime Minister is advising the President as a no confidence motion or in something like that, the whole Lok Sabha has to be dissolved. So we can say that Lok Sabha here is the major representative or the electoral body by the people and they are kind of first chamber in our parliament. So we can say that our parliament comprises of two houses which are Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha. Then the next thing that comes up here is what does the parliament do? Now is the only function of parliament to make laws is it only that no it isn't there are many other functions of parliament as well now let us discuss them one by one first is legislation we see that the parliament enacts legislations despite the fact that the parliament is a chief law making body we see that cabinets are the one initiating the policies and bureaucracy is the one under the uh, under the supervision of ministries bureaucracy is the one who make laws we have seen that in the ministry concerned there will be a minister in a ministry concerned and in that ministry the actual work would be done by a bureaucracy it has to be approved by the parliament so we can say that the parliament enacts legislations Secondly, we see financial control by the parliament. Now, do you know that where does the money for the government come from and how do they spend it? Like they spend a lot of money in many of the things we see, like buying some defense equipment or some projects in the country. So where does that come, uh, does the money come from? Of course, from taxation. And that is done by legislature. You know that whole financial control of the government is in the hands of legislature. Any budget has to be passed and approved by the Lok Sabha and we see that the parliament is the one who has to approve of all the resources and money's expenditure uh, by the government. We see that government has to inform every kind of resource, um, kind of resource buying and selling and money expenditure about projects on which money is being spent. All this information has to be provided to the parliament. So we can say that parliament has a major financial control of our country. 
entirely control over executive the most vital um, kind of function of parliament is to control the executive we will see it in a broad manner later in this chapter but now as of now you can say that the parliament has a most vital function of exercising its power over executive of our country then the parliament also has some judicial control such as to review the proposals for the rejection or kind of uh, dismissal or suspension of the president vice president the judges of supreme court or the high courts then it has some electoral functions as well the electoral functions are to elect the president or the vice president apart from that the parliament also has something some kind of representation function now you do know that the parliament is the one representing the divergent social economic religious political views of all over the country so it is kind of representation of all over the country and that's why it becomes important then next it has the power of constituent change now what happens that the amendments in the constitutions are also made by the parliament so if any amendment in the constitution has to be made it has to be approved by the majority of the parliament so we can say that all these are the functions of the parliament and there's there can be so many other functions as well but these are the major functions of the parliament of india the next topic that comes up here is powers of rajya sabha so powers of rajya sabha now basically here we're going to look at the powers of rajya sabha and how they are different from the powers of lok sabha as well now lok sabha has the power to make laws on any matters included in the union list or the concurrent list it can also make laws on money bills on the other hand rajya sabha can also make any bills or laws on any non money non money matters like it can't make a law on money bills secondly proclamation of emergency like approval for the proclamation of emergency is done by the lok sabha the election of vice president or the president is also done by the lok sabha the election of uh, the vice president and the president of our country can be done by rajya sabha as well and the suspension of the judges of supreme court and the high courts of the president and the vice president can alone be done by the rajya sabha Lok Sabha has the power to make uh, approval for the budget amendments of the constitutions. Rajya Sabha also has the uh, right to make approval for the constitutional amendment. However, it does not have any kind of uh, uh, right to approval, right to approve over any budget of the country. We see that Lok Sabha has many other functions as well, like. Uh, and you can see that financial control and there are a lot of functions of lok sabha rajya sabha has the power to include any subject in state list to union list or concurrent list why it is so let us discuss now with the next topic that is special powers of rajya sabha now there are kind of some special powers uh, bestowed to the rajya sabha what happens that the power to make the state list matters into union list matter or concurrent list matter which means that you know that on all, all the matters included in the state list only the state legislature can make laws on them however those matters can be included in the union list or the concurrent list if the rajya sabha wants because we know that rajya sabha is the representation of states state legislative assembly members have chosen them so that's why if a state has to represent itself it can only do it in the form of rajya sabha and the states uh, kind of wishes are in the rajya sabha so if the rajya sabha is a uh, kind of saying that it should be done in this area so it will be done because state list matters only concern the state state government not the central government and that is why lok sabha is not given this power because on this view only the state is concerned on the matters of state list so only the state's representative should have the power to change this and that's why rajya sabha members have been given the power to include any matter in the state list to union list or concurrent list 
However, there are some powers which are restricted only to the Lok Sabha. Only Lok Sabha can do it. And those are first of all money control, that is financial control or the money bills. The budget of a country is proposed by the Lok Sabha. Only the Lok Sabha has the power to approve them. Well, the Rajya Sabha can oppose it, can make advices on it and can delay it by 14 days. But after 14 days, that money bill will be passed and Lok Sabha is not bound to, the, uh, to listen the advice of Rajya Sabha. So we can say that the financial control, all the budget of the country is approved by the Lok Sabha and that is has been done because Lok Sabha is the complete representative, direct representative of the people and this financial control, we know that all the money for the government comes from the taxes of us common citizens. So citizens should be one uh, taking views on that matter and that's why the direct representatives of the people have been given this power. Other than that, the Council of Ministers are responsible to Lok Sabha, not to the Rajya Sabha. So we can say that there are some powers allocated only to Lok Sabha as well. That's why Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha are co-equal. <coughs> they have been given some special powers on some special matters. However, they are co-equal if you look at, uh, look at it in overall manner. The next topic that comes here is how does the parliament make laws? Now it becomes very important to know the procedure of law making because the basic function of legislature is the law making and if we don't know law, law making then what's the point of uh, starting this chapter? So that's why now let us discuss the procedure of law making. First of all, we do know that the draft of a proposed law is a bill. Bill is a raw form of any law. We know that if a bill is passed successfully in both the houses of the parliament and has been approved by the president, then it becomes a law. But going through that way, it has a very long journey. Now what happens that if a ministry is there or a kind of a minister has uh, like a brought a bill or raised a bill in parliament that bill would be sent to a committee that committee would do a draw research would do everything required to it and make a report that report to uh, will be transferred to any of the house if it is a non-money bill you should remember that if it is only a non-money bill because we do know that if it is a money bill it will directly go to the Lok Sabha. So if only if it is non-money bill then it will be sent to the Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha any of the houses of the parliament. That house of the parliament may or may not take the report of the committee. Then draw discussions would be done on that bill on that particular house of the parliament. And suppose that bill has been passed from that particular house of parliament. Then it would be sent to the other house of the parliament. Now here also through discussion debate would be done and if a joint session is required then that also will take place. Now joint session is like suppose if there is a bill and it has been passed by Lok Sabha but Rajya Sabha is opposing it. So what they have decided is joint session where there will be members of Rajya Sabha as well as Lok Sabha all the members would sit together. In that case mostly we have seen generally we have seen in a joint session the Lok Sabha is likely to prevail because Lok Sabha has more members than Rajya Sabha and the reason the reason behind it is very simple because they are the representative of the people so we can say that the that specific non-money bill has been passed from first house then it will be transferred to the second house if throw after throw debate and after so much uh, discussions on that it has been passed from that house too then it will be sent to the president for approval now from there president may or may not take it first of all we do know that for president has a first chance to uh, return it back for reconsideration so the president may or may not take it and suppose it has been passed from there as well because it has to then after that bill becomes a law so we can say that the law from becoming a bill to a law is a long journey it can't be done in just one night or one day it takes a long time 
because even if before the bill is prepared what happens that some matters are discussed in the parliament some public issues some public interest matters some social groups pressure groups opposition raise matters in the parliament on which they demand for a law to be made and that's why when a bill is made what happens that a lot of controversies go around because we have to see what will be the reaction after that bill what where there will there be many critiques or will there be many supporters that also matters so we can say that even before the bill is passed there may be a lot of discussion on that particular topic for example we see that in our country suppose a law has been made for marriage issues we see that there is a kind of controversy around from turning 18 to 21 age for women that it should be turned from 18 to 21 there are there is a lot of controversy going around it so for that if a law has to be made if a bill has to be drafted then it would be done by the law ministry of course then there may be some involvement of ministry of women and child welfare too so we can say that generally the bureaucracy is the one who drafts the bill not the uh, members of parliament however the approval of parliament becomes very important and joint session we have already seen what it is because joint session also becomes very important without joint session we can't just say how the bill will be passed from the parliament and likely it is that the Lok Sabha will prevail so we can say that this is the whole procedure of law making now laws can be of different types you know that there are government bills and private bills private bills are those which have been proposed by a non-minister and government bills are those which has been which have been proposed by minister then there can be money bill and non-money bill money bill includes all those matters such as budget financial control resources and kind of where to spend money expenditure those kind of things non-money bill has everything like you can say about projects about development of the country everything is in non-money bills and non-money bills too there can be two types ordinary bills and constitutional amendment bills so constitutional amendment bills are those which are meant for amendment in the constitution as we can see that there are a lot of amendments made in the constitution of india then uh, ordinary bills are those other than the constitutional amendment bills so there can be different types of laws or bills as well there is not just one type of bill so this is the whole procedure of law making now the next topic that comes up here is how does the parliament control the executive so how does the parliament control the executive now we see that executive is formed by a majority in Lok Sabha and often it is not difficult for executive to make cabinet dictatorship as the houses will merely follow them and they will be the one leading the parliament it can happen many times in the parliament and that's why the parliament has to be vigilant and kind of uh, you could say powerful effective as to maintain order in the parliament and as to control the executive it becomes very important to control the executive because executive are formed by the political parties or a coalition of political parties which can cause a, a kind of arbitrariness of executive and unlimited use of power so the legislature has to do it by itself and that's what has been provided by the constitution of india as well we see that the legislatures are allowed to speak in the parliament as much as they want to and on whatever what topic they have to like they are the members of parliament are not restricted to stay silent in parliament it has been seen that they are allowed to speak anything and there can't be anything against them on the basis of what they said in the parliament so we can see that the basic essence of the legislature is that they are elected by the people so they should be at the highest level and that's what has been provided by our country as well and that's why they can control the executive as well which is a very big function of parliamentary system of government which we also saw that um, in the chapter of uh, like 
executive that there is presidential system where this thing is not followed so this extra extra kind of control of executive is provided in the parliamentary system of government now let's see what are these methods one by one with the next topic that is instruments of parliamentary control so instruments what are these instruments there are mainly four instruments of parliamentary control they are first deliberation and discussion second is the uh, approval or refusal of laws third is financial control fourth is no confidence motion now let's discuss them one by one first is the deliberation and discussion we know that in a parliament the members are allowed to have a thorough discussion with the ministers what happens we see that in parliament we have question hours in question hours the members of parliament are allowed to ask anything to them like to the ministers and ministers have to answer them then there is zero hour period now in zero hour period what happens that they are allowed to ask any question on public matters even though the ministers are not bound to answer them then there are adjournment motions and raising of public issues we see that they have been asked a lot in the parliament by the members of parliament to the ministers who are in the ruling party so we can see that these are the essence of the country democratic system because we see that this question hour is very good where the ministers are asked questions about the lawmaking process about the policies the way they implement it and many more things so they have been asked and they have to answer it and that's why it will seem it will be seen as a control of legislature over the executive against the arbitrariness of the executive we see that question hour is a very good example of it in our country because it is a deliberation and discussion on which uh, it can play as an instrument of parliamentary control to the parliament as well second we have approval or ratification of laws now we see that no matter how many policies no matter how many bills have been drafted by a ministry it can only be passed by the parliament we have seen that it can only become a law when it is approved by the parliament of our country and that's also performed the both houses and that's what makes it at the upper head we see that in parliament uh, we know that the ruling party comes from the majority the government the prime minister the ministers are majorly from the ruling party and they have a ruling majority in Lok Sabha as well but what about Rajya Sabha what if they only have majority in Lok Sabha but not in the Rajya Sabha we have seen this in the cases of 1977 Janata Party rule or the NDA rule in 2000 on which we have seen that there were rejections by the Rajya Sabha on some bills such as Prevention of Terrorism Act 2002 so these are some of the instances we can see that approval or refusal ratification of laws is also done by the parliament it is a direct way of controlling the executive third is of course the financial control we see that the parliament can definitely refuse to give resources to the government it can definitely um, uh, decrease the budget of the government as well although this seldom happens but it can happen because parliament has the power to do so it has the right to do so so we can see that overall financial control of the country is in the hands of parliament to be specific the Lok Sabha we see that the budget money bills all are included in the Lok Sabha and overall we can say that the parliament so executive is bound to the Lok Sabha because without Lok Sabha they can't have their pockets full so we can say that for financial control Lok Sabha is responsible and the, the parliament is responsible on a broad manner then last and the most powerful weapon is of course no confidence motion 
Now we do know that no confidence motion is when the majority of the parliament is having no confidence in the present ruling government and they are asking for the resignation from them. So this ha can happen, although earlier they were very rare to happen, but we have seen a lot of instances after 1989. So we can say that a lot of governments were forced to resign by this no confidence motion. And this has become the most powerful weapon of the parliament because with this any government can be at default. We can say that if they have failed to fulfill their promises or they are not working for the people, they can definitely have no confidence motion. So executive is bound to have limited power and to work for the people. Otherwise, they would have no confidence motion in the Lok Sabha. So these four are the major instruments of the Lok Sabha or the parliamentary control. We can say that if they are used in an adequate manner, they can definitely be in a very good manner used. But what we say is usually different from our expectations. They can be rather fictional than real. What happens that in the first case, as we saw that deliberation discussion, we also see that in these approval uh, kind of uh, kind of we can say that throughout debates and discussions there can be some hatings as well they can be um, kind of use of words in a very negative way they can be shoutings by the ministers or the members of parliament and some people may uh, walk out of the parliament in a very angry manner in protest manner or not caring what is happening around them which causes a lot of loss of time of legislature so this can show in a very negative way as well then the other is thing uh, other thing is that we have seen a lot of boycott of the sessions the parliamentary sessions by the members of parliament or the ministers so this can happen a lot in our country as well because participants are the one they have to be enthusiastic as to carry on the process so what if they're written on the paper what if the actual things actual participants or not there so that also matters now the next topic that is here is what do the committees of parliament do so the committees of parliament now we have seen that after 1983 a lot of standing committees are formed in our country over 20 departmental committees standing committees have been formed in our country their work is not just limited to making the laws or drafting the bill but it also works the day-to-day -day work of the houses of parliament you know that expenditure of a department drafting of a bill everything because for making a bill what is important it's not just that you have to make a bill on this issue but for that a thorough research has to be done a lot of studying the demands of all the people who are in need of that bill has to be done as well and the grants given by different departments has to be studied as well then if there is corruption or not these all are done by a committee by standing committees of our country so as present we have 20 departmentally standing committees as of given in the book and we can see that they are very helpful to decrease the burden of the legislature of our country apart from that we have joint parliamentary committees as well or they are known as JPCs as well they have been formed to make laws of course to do a specific research on a specific matter for example on any specific bill or um, any specific irregularity in parliament such kind of things now joint parliamentary committee consists of members from both the houses from the house of people as well as the council of states that's why it's known as joint parliamentary committees now what happens that we do know that a bill can't be passed can't become a law until it is approved by the parliament but it rarely happens that in a parliament the report given by a committee has been kind of refused or has been uh, asked to reconsider because we see a lot of times these are directly passed by the Lok Sabha so we can say that even though there are debates on the bill I'm just saying about the reports of the committees not the discussion on the bills 
bills. Discussions on the bill still remain. So we can say that these committees become very important for our country, not just for making laws, but the day-to-day -day work of both the houses of parliament is also done by these committees. We had a lot of committees in our country, like Delimitation Commission, Mandal Commission. We have seen a lot of committees in our country. After that, we have another topic, which is how does the parliament regulate itself? So now we see that parliament is having a lot of power, like it is controlling the executive and it is having a lot of controls. What about itself? Can it become a kind of uh, under having unlimited powers or arbitrary? So we can say that parliament is the highest, largest debate forum. We can say a lot of diverse people are there and they can't just sit there peacefully they'll always be debating against each other on some particular matter and that itself shows that the parliament is regulating itself it is given it is provided by the constitution of india how to suit the procedures under the supervision of parliament and how every process would be done smoothly in the parliament for that some special arrangements are given in the constitution apart from that we can say that if there are so many people of course one person can't have the whole power they would always be against each other contradictory to each other and there is another thing what if a member you know that most of the members are on the party's ticket like most of the members of parliament are from a political party some specified political parties so those specified political parties are there what if the member after being elected as a member of parliament has ceded like has left the party and has joined another party for this purpose we have anti-defection law now this law states that it was uh, like introduced in india by the 52nd amendment act and has been slightly changed in the 91st amendment act of uh, indian constitution now what has happened that according to anti-defection law if a person has been elected as a member of parliament then that person cannot leave the party from which he or she originally belongs to and join another party if that person does so then the membership of the parliament will be taken away and if there is any ministership under his or her hands that will also be taken away so anti-defection law clearly states that if you have joined the uh, a party if there is a party you joined that party became a member of parliament and now is leaving for b party that can't happen if you do so you will no longer be a member of parliament besides that what is defection now defection mainly means that your a person is not present when he is he or she is asked to be present at that place by the party leadership or that person is voting against the wishes of party leadership or is voluntarily leaving the party that is known as defection so anti-defection is definitely against it now you can see that uh, you can say that of course anti-defection law is very good as to keep the ministers under control but what we have seen is that that the presiding officer of the parliament of both the houses of parliament and the party leadership has gained more control by this anti defection laws and minister are just under the control the members of parliament are just under the control of the party leadership and the presiding officer of both the houses there is one more thing that you must have seen that in both the houses we have a speaker that is you know that that person also has the responsibility to regulate the parliament so we can say that some arrangements have been made in the constitution to go to smooth the processes in the parliament and to regulate the parliament by itself so parliament is regulated by itself now lastly what do we conclude from it the conclusion of this chapter we see that on news you must have seen a lot of debates taking place and how the procedure of lawmaking is being 
followed in the Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha. We see that you can say that on national TV channels such as Rajya Sabha TV or Sansa TV, these TV channels, if you look at them, if you watch them, then it's very good because you will see the real structure of parliament of our country, how there are diverse people, they are uh, kind of arguing bitterly, they are speaking a lot of languages and they are just completely different. They are completely from different social backgrounds, economic backgrounds and political backgrounds. Still they are in the parliament, they are over the heads, like they are in different rainbow colors of the country and they are representing the country. Some critics can come up and say that they are just wasting the money and time of the country. However, when law is made, it is in such a way that every person would be satisfied. So that's why legislature as being the direct representative of the people and has to potentially fulfill the needs and wishes, expectations of the people. So legislature becomes the most powerful organ of the three and is the most responsible one is as well. So we can say that legislature as being the representative of citizens has a lot of burden as well. So that's all about legislature that we have studied in this chapter. We have seen, uh, we have seen a lot of things such as what exactly is legislature different aspects of legislature, the parliament, the functions of parliament and the components of our parliament as well, how it regulates executive itself and you must have understood the concept legislature very well now. So that's it for the video. The next chapters of this book will be completed in the further upcoming videos. So stay tuned for the upcoming videos. Thank you very much.